is okay because you just switch to the phone. Um, oh, yeah. Is everything okay? Sì, il professore sta facendo il passaggio dalla connessione del wifi a quella del telefono. Are you, are you switching to the uh, hotspot connection? Yes, I no. just switched. Is that working? Yeah, I mean, now I think it's, it's much yeah. better. Okay, okay again, uh, good evening to everybody and welcome to the second webinar of our series on the theme of democracy from a global perspective organized by Cisco, the Italian Society for the Study of Contemporary History. And welcome to our distinguished guest, Professor Stefan Skoronek, who is a professor of political science at Yale University. Um, just a few words. Uh, in our first webinar, Maria Rosaria Stabile of the University of Rome III outlined the tortuous path of Latin American democracy in a neoliberal order and the fragility of that order face to face to the rise of new social movements. This evening, we shift our focus on the United States. When we plan our series, it seems to us that what was perceived as the crisis of the American democracy was a result of different conflictual trajectories, party polarization, the crisis in institutional functioning of the government, racial, ethnic, and cultural conflicts, the social divide provoked by the impact of the economic crisis and the pandemic. The political and intellectual debate of the last two decades has been characterized by such words as fracture, chaos, disruption, destruction, tragedy, but also rage, social and racial anxiety, tribalization. Each part claims to fight for the soul of America. During the 2016 electoral campaign, the writer Rebecca Kazi stated, I quote, this is not a crisis of a party or awful candidates. It is a crisis of America's soul. These are dark times in our country, unquote. And then we had the January 6th with the assault to Capitol Hill provoked by a president who did not accept the result of the election. And uh, we had the second procedure uh, for impeachment. Daniel Ziblatt, who uh, with Steven Levitsky published in 2018, the book, How Democracies Die, was interviewed by the New York Times a couple of days after the insurrection. He commented, we were criticized by some as alarmists. It turns out we were alarmists enough. So Stefan Soronek is the right person to deal with the problem of the crisis of democracy, especially from an institutional point of view and the presidency in particular. Uh, it's very difficult to resume in a few words uh, Professor Skoronek's extensive curriculum and research work. Professor Skoronek is one of the founders of the American political development field which has the aim to focus on the historical construction of contemporary problems. He has been a visiting professor in many prestigious universities around the world, including Oxford and Paris. He has been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and he was inducted in 2004 into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His seminal book, Building a New American State, published in 1982, has fostered the development of a new historiography on the origins and counters of the American state. And all political historians interested in understanding uh, the characteristics and the functioning of the American state are really indebted to him. Uh, actually, I'm very indebted to his work. He also co-founded with Karen Orr in 1986, the Journal Studies in American Political Development, which he had until 2007. 
um, he has also published fundamental works on the field of presidential studies and in particular on the politics of presidential leadership. Just to mention a few, Presidential Leadership in Political Time, the third edition published in 2020, and the politics presidents make leadership from John Adams to Bill Clinton, published in 1997. He also provided the episode structure and thematic content for the PBS miniseries, The American President. His most recent book just published is Phantoms of a Beleaguered Republic, the Deep State and the United Executive, co-edited with John Dearborn and Desmond King. The book focused on what the authors defined the phantom twins, the deep state and the unitary executive, both abstractions, both conjectures, will contribute to our understanding of the development of the American state, as well as of the expansion of presidential power. So I speak too much. I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Skowronek to this webinar. At the end of Professor Skowronek's presentation, we will have time for some discussion. And please, if you have any question, I encourage you to write in the chat. So, Professor Skowronek, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you, Rafael, for that. And thanks to the Cisco board for inviting me uh, to talk about American politics at this peculiar and troubling juncture. I'm going to share my screen here because I have a So is that is that good? Oh, am, is is that coming through? Yeah, that that works. Yes, yeah, it works. Okay, great. So my talk for today, as Rafaela said, uh, draws on this new book that I've written with uh, John Dearborn and Des King. It's called Phantoms of a Beleaguered Republic, the Deep State and the Unitary Executive. Uh, it's just out this month from Oxford University Press. I should say, I should start by saying that this book is not a follow-up to my previous work on the presidency. It's not. Uh, back in the 1990s, I did a historical analysis arguing that presidential leadership in America unfolds in sequences of what I called political time. My thesis was that presidents acting in political time periodically drive the entire regime toward flashpoints of disjunction and reconstruction. I do think that the political time thesis has held up pretty well these past 30 years. I think it illuminates something of, about the Trump era and about the Trump-Biden transition, and I'd be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A if you'd like. But this book is something different. It shifts the historical analysis onto a different plane. The issues that it gets at are, I think, more pressing for Americans today. If there's a point of tangency between my prior work and this new book, it's that both counter the temptation to personalize assessments of the presidency. Both seek meaning instead in the changing structure of American government and politics. Now there's no denying that personal factors loom large over the Trump presidency. And there's no denying that Joe Biden rose to office as a studied contrast in character Nonetheless, I think that these character as destiny arguments are short-sighted and that we emphasize these personal elements at our peril. For five years, a steady drumbeat of commentary tried to convince us that Trump was an anomaly. We were told that he wasn't a normal president. We treated his presidency as sui generis and an aberration. These assessments fit comfortably with Joe Biden's own characterization of the Trump era, the one that he encapsulates in his assertion that this is not who we are. But if that's the case, where did this alleged anomaly come from? And what is this normal we long to return to? I think it's more important now than ever to remind ourselves that presidents are homegrown products of our political system. 
there are no aliens. Rather than bracket Trump's performance, we set out in this book to open it up to a more systemic inquiry. Phantoms puts the focus squarely on the institutional arrangements that made Trumpism possible. It examines the Trump presidency as a significant commentary on the state of the state in America. I won't try to summarize the book here. Suffice it to say it revolves around two propositions or conjectures about American institutions. One alleges a deep state conspiracy, the other a unitary executive. We were interested in how these two propositions work together, positioning the president to wage an all out assault on the executive branch of American government. And we were interested in how the American constitution became an instrument for precisely what it was designed to avoid. What I would like to do here though, is to dwell a bit on the institutional backstory to Trump's offensive to situate Trump's war on the state within a larger developmental frame. I wanna dwell on this backstory because in my view, that's where we find the essential problem of the presidency. The Trump presidency stands out on this backdrop because it exposed the problems of the presidency per se. I'll try in these remarks to crack that problem open and to bring it into full view. Surveying the path that we've taken to this point, I'll also explain what we mean in the book when we call the current state of affairs a beleaguered republic. And I'll assess the differences between Trump and Biden in that light. And then finally, by tapping into our long prior history of responses to the problem of the presidency, I think I'll be able in the end to provide some insights into what it will take to correct this institution's wayward course. Well, American politics in the Trump era was a spectacle, the action seemingly larger than life. But for all its fireworks, the Trump presidency was also enormously clarifying. The thesis of my talk today is that it exposed the nub of the problem of presidential democracy. All of a sudden, issues that scholars have been circling around for decades were displayed in sharp relief. What do I mean by that? Well, Presidents mobilize the electorate and presidents manage the state. We like to think that these two assignments go hand in hand, that they complement one another. That after all is what presidential democracy is all about. But there's nothing natural about the alignment of these two activities. Indeed, how they are aligned has always been the critical question. What we see now, perhaps for the first time, is that our entire constitutional system has from the very beginning turned on that alignment. That is on how from one period to the next, management and mobilization were brought to bear on one another. We can see that clearly now because in 2016 and again in 2020, the contending candidates for the presidency cut cleanly through this job description. They divvied up the usual jumble of expectations, splitting them down the middle. Donald Trump was all about political mobilization. He knew little of the inner workings of government and he had little interest in learning about them. His presidency was an unrelenting managerial disaster. But Trump did know how to build a political movement and sustain a fierce following. He unleashed pent up grievances. He stigmatized the state as a swamp of corruption. And with that, he remained throughout a political force to be reckoned with. As if in response, Joe Biden is all about sound management. He's long on experience. He's wise in the ways of institutions. He's policy ready. Biden, like Hillary Clinton before him, is the consummate state operative. Biden promises us that he will, and I quote, manage the hell out of the current crisis. He echoes the rallying cry of the Clinton campaign. I believe in science. Like Clinton before him, Biden wrapped himself in preset standards of best practice. He appealed to our faith in government and in managerial competence. But leaders who place their faith on good government and managerial competence, well, they're prone to fade quickly. The premise is that they know how to make the system work and how to tackle the big issues, but 
the big issues just keep coming and the opening to presidential direction tends to close quite quickly. Without mobilized support from a politically committed following, there's little chance of staying afloat. In 2016, we elected a mobilizer. In 2020, we elected a manager. A presidential democracy won't work if it's one thing or the other. In Trump's administration, and I use that word light loosely, management became indistinguishable from mobilization. Running the executive branch as the direct extension of the Trump party, the president nearly hollowed the government out. For Biden, it seems just the opposite. Intent on restoring the government's authority and affirming its integrity, he set himself up as a model of self-restraint. And that leaves us to wonder where his leadership will find a cutting edge. I don't think switching horses is going to resolve the issues now before us. The American system is now generating, leading, generating leadership caricatures and putting the essential elements of democratic governance across purposes. Something's gone awry. That's why I recommend looking to the backstory. Revisiting the prior course of development can help us figure out how we landed in this predicament. And more than that, it must, might just provide some clues as to a way out. At the very least, it would be re worth recovering the audacious spirit of our history. That is the willingness displayed in America's past to upend and discard institutional arrangements that we found wanting and to engage in thoroughgoing rearrangements of presidential democracy. Our prior experience with this office suggests that if we want to make presidential democracy in America work again, we too will need to recast its basic terms and operating conditions. When I say that management and mobilization frame the essential problem of the American presidency, I mean to say that the current predicament has very deep roots. It was in fact baked in to the initial construction of the presidential office. The framers of the constitution grappled with this relationship directly and they were quite candid in their thinking about it. They were skittish about political leadership. Mobilizing the electorate around the presidency seemed to them dangerous and counterproductive. They wanted presidents to faithfully execute the law. And that meant detaching the executive power from other more particular political interests. The formula that they came up with was management without mobilization. And that solution all but squeezed out any serious consideration of the vital elements of presidential democracy. There was in fact no mention of nominations or parties or campaigns. It's no small irony of Trump's electoral college victory over Hillary Clinton in 2016, that the framers had crafted the electoral college to sideline political mobilizers and to promote management by someone who might stand safely above the fray. Their original selection procedure was an attempt to forestall interstate cooperation, to strengthen the hand of local notables, to filter out the biases of candidate competition and partisan political appeals. Their election was to be blind and indirect. Specially designated electors for each state were to vote in their respective localities. They were to act all at the same time, but in isolation from one another. They were to select two candidates, two people, one of whom had to be an outsider from their state. But they weren't to distinguish which of these two they preferred to be president. In that sense, it was a blind election. James Wilson was the chief architect of the Electoral College, and along with Alexander Hamilton, who was a leading advocate at the Constitutional Convention for a strong and independent presidency. When Wilson recommended this Electoral College procedure, he boasted that it would strengthen the presidency by detaching selection from discrete political interests and by defeating the programmatic ambitions of factions. Today, these arrangements seem arcane. They proved unworkable even in their own time. All the more remarkable then is that Wilson's scheme was one of the few elements of the constitution that elicited virtually no criticism at its time. It's worth asking why. The enduring insight into behind that original arrangement is that national political leadership is inherently divisive. 
It's disruptive and destabilizing. Presidents elected with mandates drawn directly from the people seek to transform things, and that poses a threat to the steady administration of the laws. Presidents are entrusted to manage the commitments of the nation as a whole, but as political leaders, they're going to be, hope that they're going to be beholden to the interests of a part. Joe Biden is today straining to reconcile these two phases of legitimacy to unify the nation behind his leadership, while at the same time insisting on his party's priorities. Alexander Hamilton saw plainly the managerial nightmare implicit in this presidential democracy. He speculated that political leaders elected on campaign promises would be prone to reverse and undo the work of their predecessors. Mobilization around the presidency would introduce a disgraceful and ruinous mutability into the administration of government. In other words, popularly elected leaders will, if left to their own devices, produce a state perpetually at odds with itself. That is what made management without mobilization seem like a great idea. But it wasn't a great idea. There was no denying national political leadership and the fact that the constitution relied on an arcane and attenuated version of it, that it set up a government that could be threatened by a robust democracy and by an electorate mobilized around the presidency. These, these are not small details. These threats have riddled the, pres the American presidency ever since. Given the practical limitations of the framers formula, Reconciling government management with political mobilization has been an ongoing challenge. That problem has never just taken care of itself, nor was it ever something we felt comfortable leaving to presidents to resolve on their own. Basic as it is, we've had to return to this relationship time and again. If there's any comfort to be found at the current impasse is that we've had a lot of experience in addressing this relationship. Getting it right is something we've been trying to do for some 230 years. We have in fact rearranged American government repeatedly, self-consciously and profoundly to accommodate political mobilization around the presidency. Time and again, we found that reconciling mobilization with an acceptable system of government management entailed altering basic constitutional relationships. At each of these junctures, we invented new institutions to mediate the competing values in play. And each solution moved progressively farther away from the Constitution's original design. I wanna flag that point because I mean to show it has profound implications today. Now when presidents are reaching back to the Constitution for justification, the meaning and intent of that original design gets turned on its head. These Republican remedies departed from the Constitution in three fundamental ways. First, they all acceded to the inevitable disruptions of presidential democracy, and they strengthened the president's role as a national political leader. Second, they all employed structural overlays to ease the Constitution's formal separation of powers. And third, they all installed new power sharing arrangements arrangements that infuse the disruptions of presidential democracy with a heavy dose of collective responsibility and that shifted toward more cooperative systems of government management. The history of these adaptations is familiar to most Americans, but I don't think that they've ever been understood in precisely this way as a series of solutions to a common problem, all of which advanced power sharing and institutional cooperation against the Constitution's formal separation of powers. Each rearrangement acknowledged that presidential democracy does entail imposing the interests of a part on the commitments of a whole, but each addressed concerns about those impositions with Republican remedies, solutions that depersonalize the effect and broaden confidence in it. So I wanna run through these solutions quickly here. The first significant endorsement of presidential democracy came in 1804 with the 12th Amendment to the Constitution. It acknowledged the political character of selection and the inevitability of mobilization by requiring the electors to make separate choices 
for the president and vice president, vote for two, but only one for president. Upon ratifying that change, the Jeffersonians immediately pulled Congress into the crucial mediating role. The framers of the Constitution had spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to get Congress out of the business of presidential selection. That was critical to their separation of powers scheme. The Jeffersonians altered that scheme significantly by making Congress the first mover in presidential selection. The Congressional Caucus hammered out a political consensus at the top. It selected a national party ticket and then coordinated its election down below. This arrangement turned electoral mobilization around the, around the presidency into a joint effort. And eventually it mixed the interests of the legislative and executive branches together in managing the affairs of state. Two decades later, King Caucus was overthrown and presidential democracy got a second boost. A more robust two-party system gave presidential power political footings outside of the formal institutions of government. And with that popular base, presidents strengthened their claims to represent the will of the people. But antebellum institution builders took care to pair those pretensions with a convention system of nomination that thrust state and local party organizations into the crucial mediating role. In contrast to the Jeffersonian solution, which worked top down, this one worked bottom up. The party conventions tended to produce dark horse candidates, compromise choices reflective of a consensus hammered out by the far flung parts of the coalition arrayed behind them. The parties then mobilized the electorate behind their candidates and the successful candidates completed the bargain by distributing the largesse of the federal, of the, of the executive branch, by distributing those coveted paid jobs back to the local machines that had put them in office. The party-based presidency of the 19th century gave us the spoil system. It disassembled the executive branch and thoroughly politicized it. Virtually the entire civil service was rotated out and replaced with each change of administration. Pulling mobilization and management more closely together, this solution pushed even farther afield of the original constitutional design. The point to underscore is that this was above all a power sharing arrangement, one that knit all the institutions of the constitutional system more closely together in a far reaching community of interests. Presidents were expected to do equal and exact justice to every party faction. In effect, they used their nominal control over the personnel of the executive branch to strengthen the position of local officers and congressional representatives. The separations of the constitutional system were overcome by turning presidential management into office, bro office brokerage for the bosses, the bosses who operated in dispersed centers of political power. Well, just as the Jacksonians overthrew King Caucus, 20th century progressives set out to emancipate the presidency from boss rule. But the progressives were no more interested than their forebears in returning to the constitution for inspiration. They pushed ahead with arrangements of their own. Like the Jeffersonians and Jacksonians, the progressives wanted stronger political leaders in the White House, but they were looking for strengths of a different kind. They wanted to raise the president's national profile. In particular, they wanted presidents to set the national agenda, to mobilize the electorate personally around a national program of action and to spearhead the enactment of that program in the Congress. The constitutional scheme is hardly even recognizable in the progressive redesign. They had little use for the separation of presidential power from congressional power, they wanted to join what the constitution had separated to make the president the legislative leader. At the same time, the progressives wanted to separate what the constitution had joined. They worked to cordon off management, the management of national programs from political pressures. They wanted to insulate the executive branch from political manipulation. To put some distance between administrative management and presidential politics, the progressives promoted independent agencies, independent audits, a merit-based civil service, the removal of administrators only for cause, piling layers, of piling layers of insulation onto administration 
the progressives deepened the state considerably. Mobilization around the presidency was useful to the progressives in expanding the reach of programmatic action in the Congress, but once the programs were enacted, competence and continuity in their operation became the priority. These progressive efforts to lodge common interests in administration extended to the president's interactions with Congress as well. To enhance the credibility of their recommendations to the legislature, presidents were given new overhead agencies, the Bureau of the Budget, the Council of Economic Advisors, the National Security Council. All of these surrounded presidents themselves with the authority of experts. Knowledge-based authority played the crucial mediating role in this scheme. It was the coin of the realm, the common currency that knit the new management system together. Now the breakdown of that progressive scheme began decades ago. Not surprisingly, it followed on the heels of another major democratization of the polity. When the rights revolution of the 60s and 70s upended the last vestiges of localism and social hierarchy, it vastly expanded the authority and administrative reach of the federal government. One effect of this more inclusive and diverse polity was that all issues in effect became national issues. Another effect is that it became much harder to induce institutional collaboration or to manufacture a modicum of consensus in state operations. A new normal divided government magnified conflicts between president and Congress, and not just conflicts over policy, but conflicts over the rules for managing the executive branch as well. The expansion of the relevant polity and the nationalization of politics put the Republican remedies of earlier days under intense pressure. Distrust was evident on both sides of the constitutional divide. Instead of new overtures to cooperation, tit for tat assertions and responses precipitated a constitutional face off. Presidents packed the agencies of the executive branch with political loyalists, creating what we call an administrative presidency. Congress reacted with new surveillance mechanisms like whistleblower protection laws and inspectors general. The demise of localism and the nationalization of politics affected common interests in political mobilization as well. The party reforms of the 1970s gutted the convention system of nomination and the new primary based selection system gave rise to candidate centered campaigns and movement based mobilizations. At once then, the political foundations of cooperative management weakened and presidents became more independent in political action. When we use the term beleaguered republic in the title of our book, we're referring to this deterioration of once sturdy provisions for managing the disruptions of presidential democracy collectively and to the concomitant attractions of governing separately within the White House. This shift from governing collectively through the presidency to governing personally within the presidency, this was a subtle but profound move. Beginning in the 1970s, presidents one to the next began fusing the basic elements of presidential democracy together in a new and uniquely virulent combination. Mobilization around a personal party was joined ever more tightly to personal management of the executive branch. Here again, there was a complex of factors at work. One cornerstone of the progressive solution that is presidential leadership of Congress, well, that was as a practical matter thwarted by the persistence of divided government. And the expanded reach of the executive branch played a part as well. That made direct control of administration an increasingly attractive strategy for presidents looking for leadership opportunities. Under these conditions, the separation of administration from politics, another mainstay of that progressive state, was exposed for what it had always been, a check on the ambitions of a presidential party. In this altered state though, that check became a sore point. The presidential party began putting administrative insulation under increasing pressure. Soon it was seen as an affront to the constitutional authority of the president as head of the executive branch. 
Indeed, the hallmark of this change was a rather abrupt shift back to the Constitution and back to the separation of powers. Unlike the Republican remedies of the past, this new structural overlay did not promote power sharing. And unlike the original scheme for separating powers, this one did not counter politicization of the executive branch. In fact, it promoted it. Republican presidents led the way. They linked their burgeoning conservative insurgency to a shamelessly stark reading of Article II of the Constitution. Acting on a theory of the unitary executive, they asserted exclusive hierarchical control over the government's administrative resources. The unitary executive is a constitutional inference. It's a conjecture about original intent extrapolated from the opening sentence of Article II of the Constitution. Read literally, this vesting clause mandates a strict separation of powers between president and Congress. It assigns the powers of the executive branch to the president, and by implication, it casts aspersions on all of those institutional improvisations that have been designed earlier to secure collective interests in the management of the federal government. Justice Antonin Scalia, a Reagan appointee, put a fine point on this new formalism. The vesting clause, he said, does not give the president some of the executive power. It even, doesn't even give him the preponderance of the executive power. It gives him all the executive power. The idea is ex an executive branch unified under presidential control. In the course of development, these had become fighting words. Under the unitary theory, civil service protections, for cause removal protections, independent agencies, independent audits, independent prosecutors, inspectors general, whistleblowers, legislative vetoes, all of the apparatus of the progressive state become suspect. Democratic presidents tend to be less doctrinaire in these matters, but I don't think that the party difference should be exaggerated. To be sure, Jimmy Carter promised relief from the personalization of power under Richard Nixon. But, but Carter pioneered the use of the primary system to take over a national party. And his insurgency took direct aim at bureaucratic waste and inefficiency. Carter worked assiduously to make the executive branch more responsive to his political overseers. And before long, he was renouncing his own administrators for insufficient loyalty to their chief. Bill Clinton had an opportunity to roll back Republican innovations, innovations like central review of agency rules and regulations. But Clinton chose to strengthen hierarchical controls instead. He used his new rules, blurred the distinction between White House supervision and presidential authority to direct the agencies to take specific actions. Barack Obama, too, publicly criticized his predecessor for an inflated view of presidential prerogative. But when Congress blocked action on Obama's, prerogative, on Obama's priorities, he used the strong arm of executive power to get what he wanted. DACA, his signature immigration policy, was achieved through a particularly brutal assertion of presidential will over administrators' objections. Obama's nominee to the Supreme Court, Elena Kagan, sealed her reputation in legal circles as an advocate of this new thinking about control of the, exec of the executive branch. She called her guiding principle presidential administration. Donald Trump's full-throated presidentialism was but a crystallization of these trends. Trump was an insurgent and his hostile takeover of the Republican party openly mocked all lingering pretensions to a collective enterprise. Trump was also a loner and thus a natural advocate of the unitary theory. Trump received instruction on the finer points of this argument from legal advisors drawn from the intellectual seedbed of the theory, the Federalist Society. Attorney General William Barr, a society stalwart, assured Trump that he alone was the executive branch. Trump's own articulation of that idea was crude, but not far off the mark. He said, I have an article too where I have a right to do whatever I want as president. 
Working off these premises of a unitary executive, Trump proceeded to strip away the accumulated layers of insulation that protected administrators and to subordinate them to his will. This actually is what the book is about. I'm going to summarize in a few sentences the, the guts of the book, what the book uh, really goes into detail on. But Trump gutted civil service protections and challenged for cause removal provisions in court. He deputized his personal advisors as a loyalty police to surveil the executive branch agencies. He sidelined government scientists, policy experts, and career professionals. He marginalized the Foreign Service. He used his formal position as the chief law enforcement officer to shatter norms of prosecutorial independence at the Justice Department. He fired inspector generals at will. He disregarded the uniform code of military justice. He disassembled whole agencies deemed hosp hostile to his priorities. In a last symbolic move, Trump issued an executive order. Here he is on his way out the door. He issues his last executive order stripping career civil servants of all policymaking authority. Trump not only deployed unitary claims aggressively, he also gave the theory a significant twist. The deep state conspiracy, an idea that may have come from presidential advisor Steve Bannon, added something that was only implicit in the legal theory. Another conjecture with a broad reach, the deep state took what had been a largely formal constitutional claim and sharpened its political edge. It conjured a self-anointed band of guardians working within the executive branch to thwart the will of the people as expressed in the last presidential election. So Trump stigmatized bureaucratic intermediation in two ways. Not only was it an affront to the president as the singular power of the executive branch, it was also an affront to the people who had elected him. Much was written during the Trump years about both the deep state charge and the unitary executive claim, but what was lost in these commentaries was the crucial link between them. As we show in the book, the deep state served as an indispensable enemy, the perfect foil for advancing the case for a unitary executive. It broadened the president's constitutional claim to exclusive hierarchical control over executive power by joining it to a political mandate and a plebiscitary prerogative. The effect of this was astounding. By setting himself against a shadow government, Trump was able to use a constitutional theory to magnify the personal populist charismatic character of his power. The notion that the constitution rejects power of that kind was met with a characteristic response from Trump's mobilized base. Get over it, elections have consequences. At a practical level, the deep state became something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. For the president's aggressive assertions of personal control all but compelled administrators to resist. Instinctively, they doubled down on their own resources, that is, on their statutory authority, on their knowledge-based credentials, on their media connections, on their interest group supports. That resistance in turn fed Trump's assertions. So conjecture piled upon conjecture, leaving the American public playing host to an eerie face-off. The unitary executive and the deep state became the phantom twins of the Trump era. The two conjectures drew one another out and tore at one another. These altercations rocked the Trump presidency. And every one of those controversies exposed the awkward structure upon which the whole system had been built. Let me sharpen that last point. I wanna call your attention back to the intimate and paradoxical connection between this bizarre spectacle and the basic structure from which it sprang. The Trump administration was the mirror image of the original formula for the presidency, that is management without mobilization. The Trump administration was also the full embodiment of the problem in the separation of powers that the framers had been at pains to head off through their peculiar selection system. But that solution was itself flawed and successive attempts to overcome its limitations had as if by fate led circuitously back 
to the framers' nightmare. In Trump's presidency, it became mobilization all the way down. All governance values absorbed into presidential partisanship. It was Hamilton's disgraceful and ruinous mutability in the administration of government. Now, I'm not here with a plan. What's important at this juncture is to get the diagnosis right. And in that regard, I do think that there are important lessons to be drawn about the current state of affairs from our prior experience. So let me close with three. The first is a caution against placing faith in presidential promises to fix things up. Trump's idiosyncrasies have made it easy to personalize these issues, to bracket them, and to look to Joe Biden to set things right. Clearly, Biden has taken the cue. His good government message is full of promises of self-restraint. He tells us that he'll respect the independence of the Justice Department, that he'll defer to the public health professionals in his response to the pandemic, that he'll take his lead from the scientists at the EPA. Well, that sounds pretty good, but note that this approach is every bit as personal as Trump's. And in that regard, it deflects attention from the fundamental question that's raised by Trumpism. The focus now has to be on whether presidents should have discretion in these matters. Is deference to science or respect for prosecutorial independence something the presidents should still be allowed to decide for themselves? something they provide or not in whatever way seems politically expedient to them. Choosing the Trump brand in search of relief, uh, I'm sorry, choosing the Biden brand in search of relief from the Trump brand, that concedes too much to presidentialism. This is what comes from thinking about the problem of Trumpism as personal. It's not personal, it's institutional. It's always been institutional. Good character and well-intentioned overtures will only take us so far toward a resolution. Barack Obama couldn't reverse course, and my guess is that Trump won't, uh, that Biden won't either. Because Biden's approach is largely reactive and contingent, the structural tensions within it are readily apparent. His promise to restore some semblance of regular order is already rubbing hard against the substantive demands of his followers. And I think we delude ourselves if we think he's gonna be able to do both. Progressive interests are demanding that Biden enact their policy preferences as quickly as possible, and that he engage in unilateralism on a Trumpian scale to do so. Ironically, at the same time, the Biden administration is casting a skeptical eye on congressional proposals that in reaction to the Trump era, would seek to pr protect administrators and to bolster legislative oversight of the executive branch. Biden's legal advisor, Bob Bauer, lost no time warning against reforms that threaten presidential control of the executive power. Like Carter in the post-Watergate era, the Biden administration would prefer that the president remain the arbiter of best practices. We've been indulging that conceit for 50 years, and we now know where it leads. In my view, there's simply no substitute for another deliberate reconstruction of the mechanics of this government. The question is whether the friends of American democracy can set aside their policy demands, their, their demands for immediate action on their various policy enthusiasms, set them aside long enough to reclaim this tradition of reworking the foundations of presidential politics. A second, no less timely admonition follows, and that is that there's only so much we're going to be able to take from the Constitution by way of guidance. One of the most potent achievements of the conservative insurgency in America has been intellectual. Conservative legal theorists have successfully turned the discussion of presidential power back to the Constitution. Today, everyone is debating the vesting clause. Everyone is a formalist. Everyone's trying to figure out what the framers really meant and how to get straight with their intent. We find ourselves for the first time at the mercy of a gaggle of constitutional theorists and the judges that they've trained. Lost in those debates is the stark failure of the framers formula for presidential stewardship. Management without mobilization was a non-starter. 
two centuries of institutional improvisation sought to compensate for the limitations in that formula. And the various solutions reformers came up with were all more or less direct critiques of the constitutional design. If we're looking for a useful path to draw on, we might refocus our attention there. The best reason to do that is that the cumulative effect of all of these innovations have radically altered the stakes of a sharp turn back to the Constitution. Now, I know that the current vogue for constitutional originalism has as many critics as it has advocates. But my point here, the point I want to make here is a specific one. I'm saying when, the, and when it comes to originalism, you shouldn't be free to pick and choose. The framers selection system was arcane. It's been thoroughly superseded, so thoroughly superseded that it's easy to overlook its original terms. But as every good textualist will tell you, the constitution selection system follows immediately after its vesting clause. The provisions for empowerment and selection were intimately textually connected. When the constitution separated powers, it vested the executive power in an office who was to be only tenuously connected to a popular following. Keeping that popular leadership at bay was the Constitution's way of binding the president more tightly to his duty to faithfully execute the law. To make the president safe for managing the commitments of the nation as a whole, the framers of the Constitution tried to remove the office as far as possible from factional and partisan interests. Now that didn't work. I'm not suggesting that we go back to that solution. That would be silly. But at the same time, I would suggest that combining a strict reading of the vesting clause with a selection system that's changed radically since that clause was written, that that combination is downright perverse. The mismatch is glaring. It's a forced marriage. Forced marriages never end well. If current debates over whether or not the framers intended to give the president all the executive power, if those debates seem stilted and deceptive, it's because they're willfully indifferent to the terms and conditions of that initial delegation. If there's one indisputable fact from the founding period that's still worth holding on to, is that the framers of the Constitution were at pains to prevent the executive power from becoming the strong arm of the president's personal party. That was their nightmare, and that's become our reality. Reaching back to their designs now to justify a presidential takeover of administration, that's a historical sleight of hand. It's a political ploy that doesn't bear scrutiny. Quite simply, it's a formula for Trumpism. And that points to the most important lesson of all. For better or worse, management and mobilization are always intimately connected. Every time we've sought to strengthen the presidency, we've had to reconstruct that relationship. Now that things have gone awry, we'll need to reconstruct it again. But reconstruction will entail reworking both sides of the presidential job description and doing so with an eye to their bearing on one another. A holistic approach like that is especially important if the objective is to regain some semblance of collective responsibility in a presidential democracy. Today, there are changes afoot on both fronts, but they're proceeding largely independently of one another. On one side, reactions to Trumpism are, have spawned a variety of proposals designed to insulate administrators more effectively from arbitrary impositions. But bolstering the bureaucracy without strengthening the democracy that doesn't seem likely to produce a very responsible, much less adorable settlement. On the other side is the current agitation over voting rights. Democracy reforms are long overdue in America, but they won't succeed if they don't correspond to some revised formula for governance. They have to be related conceptually and organizationally to some new understanding of how the state is to operate. And it's that connection that's not being made. If history tells us anything, it's that there's no salvaging the presidency if we don't get this relationship right. Now, I won't deny that this is a daunting challenge. We've worked our way into a dark corner in America. 
from this vantage point, our prior history of inventiveness in periodically reconstructing presidential democracy, well, that may seem more sobering than inspiring. But now as before, presidential democracy will have to be reimagined if it's going to thrive. The real question is whether we can find the courage to do for ourselves what our forebears did so many times before. And with that, I'll say thank you and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor Skoranek, for your insightful analysis. Um, sure, we could discuss a lot on the various aspects you were enlightened. Uh, as I said before, we have a time for discussion, so I ask the audience to, to write in, in the chat or otherwise to raise the hand if she, they want to, to talk directly. And um, however, I use the privilege of the chair to raise a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, as I well understood the weakness of American political parties or better the transformation of political parties into service oriented parties as largely contributed to the preeminence of mobilizers over the managers. Um, as John Aldrich stated some years ago, political parties are not anymore in control of candidates, but in service of candidates. Uh, in, in your previous book, you suggested that you should, we should combine the political time of the parties with the historical time of the presidents in order to discuss the intrinsic nature of a presidential leadership. But you also cautioned that the transformation of politics due uh, above all to the technological transformation of uh, communication was changing managerial characteristics in micro-managerial attitudes. So is this micromanagement attitude uh, what is also contributed to the emphasis on mobilization instead of management? Uh, or it helped to undermine management um, um, in, uh, and to emphasize uh, mobilization. Um, because of this process, uh, political parties seems uh, to not be able to tame the populist impulses of candidates and uh, of course once elected the president. And my second question refers to the problem of the institutional transformation of the presidency. In the 1830s, Tocqueville wrote that the president of, of the United States possessed almost royal prerogatives which had an opportunity of exercising as you um, you clearly uh, and perfectly stated that this is not the case anymore. Um, as we all know, foreign and military policy on one hand and economic emergencies on the other hand have been the two areas that historically have encouraged the enlargement of a presidential authority. For instance, the creation of the huge amount of agencies and offices has been the founding pillars with, that contributed to the transformation of the presidency into a unitary uh, executive. So my question, who, who legitimized who? Um, for instance, you, you, you mentioned the progressives and you did not mention the New Deal and the, and the Roosevelt transformation of the uh, presidency in a institutional presidency. And uh, I, I wonder if you do not consider this, uh, this passage a sort of a turning point as uh, some historians uh, have thought. And, um, about the deep state. Was Trump's attack on the deep state just an affirmation of his personal authority? 
was his invocation of a direct hierarchical and inclusive control over the government's administrative resources, as you stated in your last book, qualitatively different from analogous invocations of the previous presidents, for instance, George W. Bush and, and, and the war on terror. So I, I, I wonder if um, there is a sort of a turning point due to the Trump's attack and the, uh, on the deep state as a sort of a consp on conspiratorial um, um, problem uh, and and the sort of uh, the creation of uh, of the other in order to legitimize his personal authority. Um, sorry, if I'm not so clear. <laughs> and uh, should I, should I uh, take a step? Take a step. Please, yes, please. Yeah, I think well, in this book, which we're, we're, we're arguing that uh, Trump is the Trump is not an anomaly. Trump is the culmination yeah. of trends, and those trends begin really in the wake of the civil rights movement and the reforms of the 1960s and 70s. And part of what those reforms did were um, to well, the first thing, the most important thing they did was that they gutted the convention system of nomination and with it, any sense of collective responsibility between the president and his party. And the second thing that they did uh, was to create this kind of new movement politics, this politics that would be organized around social movements directly attached to presidential candidates. And Th those developments, which really gestated in the 1970s, culminate, uh, we, we argue, culminate in the Trump presidency. Trump, is, Trump didn't invent this, he took advantage of it. So uh, your question about George W. Bush, uh, George W. Bush <laughs> uh, uh, was a fierce advocate of the unitary executive. The unitary executive theory develops right in the wake of the Nixon presidency. And you see it in the Ford presidency. Uh, you know, Ford is unelected. He comes to power when Nixon resigns. And the people around him, like Dick Cheney and Antonin Scalia, those are his advisors, say, you've got to stand, you have no popular legitimacy You've got to stand on your constitutional prerogatives. That really is where this unitary idea comes from. Stand on the separation of powers. Then Ronald Reagan's, uh, Ronald Reagan's attorney general, Edwin Meese, develops this into a theory and it says, for now on, we're going to stress the separation of powers as the basis of our authority. And why is that? because divided government has made it much more difficult for presidents to get their, to get their programs through Congress. And administration is now controlling virtually all the major social questions in America. And therefore, if you can control administration, it's an alternative way of governing. So from Reagan to Bush to Trump, really from Ford to Bush to Trump, Ford to Reagan to Bush to Trump is, uh, is a continuous elaboration of this idea of an administrative presidency of leading through control of the executive branch. And what we wanted to say in this book is that that is a break. That is, that is a, while, while it's couched as a constitutional theory and couched as this is the way the framers intended it, this is what the separation of powers is about, we have 200 years of history which is criticizing that idea. 200 years of history, which is trying to find ways to prevent the separation of powers from turning the executive branch into a strong arm of the president's party. The irony of turning to the constitution to justify Trumpism is I think the most dangerous thing afoot in presidential politics today. I'll say uh, your first question I think was about the progressives and the new deal. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's true 
you know, if you look at Franklin Roosevelt in the New Deal and his reorganization plan, he was proposing something that looked very much like the unitary executive. He wanted to abolish the independent commissions. He wanted to abolish the independent audit. He wanted the president to have carte blanche reorganization authority in the executive branch. But the interesting thing about that proposal is that it was defeated. It was defeated. And the compromise mm -hmm. proposal that the Congress came up with was very much a power sharing scheme. That the president would be given incrementally more control over management, but Congress would maintain the independent audit. Congress would maintain the independent commissions. The president's reorganization authority would be limited. It was very much still in the progressive tradition of preventing the president from take from a, an administrative takeover. And in that sense, I think the results of the New Deal, what came out of the New Deal was very much in the progressive tradition of the separation of politics from the administration. Thanks. Uh, however, the problem of a world power um, has been continually challenging the, 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 the sort of uh, the cooperation between uh, Congress and, well, uh, and the presidency and the problem of, of, of the war powers has been one of the pillars of the emergence of a unitary executive, is, if I'm not wrong. You know, uh, interesting because um, the War Powers Act, 1974, 1973, 1974, the War Powers Act, if you read the War Powers Act, I think really it is Congress's attempt to set up a new cooperative relationship. It says to the president, okay, you can have 60 days. <laughs> you can have 60 days to make a war, but then you have to come back to us. You have to tell us why, you have to tell us when it's gonna be over and we have to authorize it within 30 days. It's really a kind of, okay, you know, back and forth. Now presidents, beginning with Gerald Ford, have made a mockery of that effort. And when they, Gerald Ford, uh, uh, disregarded the terms of the War Powers Act. And why did he do that? Or how, on what basis did he do that? He said, separation of powers, right? Separation of powers, I am in control of the military. I can order the military to do whatever I want. So I think, you know, I look at the War Powers Act as this kind of last gasp congressional effort to reestablish some kind of cooperative arrangement and presidents using the separation of powers to, to uh, cut that off and to say, no, we're in charge. Mm -hmm. And the irony of course, is that now the, under, under the terms of all these other cooperative agreements, we allow the executive branch and the executive power and the administrative power to grow large, you know, sort of a bait and switch. It's like you let it grow large on the terms of all this, these cooperative agreements and then say, oh, well, forget those cooperative agreements. It's all in the original constitution that I control it all, right? It's a kind of bait and switch, uh, which is I think uh, <laughs> very dangerous for the future of American government. Yes, I think the most important thing is the, the crisis of a political institution so much more than the, 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 the racial, ethnic, and social conflicts uh, right now in, in the United States, as of course you. What you I worry about is this intellectual conversation in, a, in the United States, which has bought into this constitutional discourse. It's got to be, what did the framers really mean? What did the, what does the vesting clause really mean? And sort of disregarding this long history, which is really a critique of all that and a recognition that the framer system didn't work. Yes, from uh, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, who define the, the president's a sort of a Polish king, for instance. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> of course. Um, uh, are there any questions from the floor? Um, I don't see any questions. So we, we could thank Professor Skoronek for his generosity. I hope we have other 
opportunities in the next future to continue our conversation. Um, I just want to remind you the next event that will be held on April the 9th. Uh, Thomas Hansen of Stanford University will lecture us on violence, Hindu nationalism, and erosion of democracy in India. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Skoronak. Thank you Thanks to all audience. And uh, we'll uh, see you next time for the next webinar. Thank Maybe. you. Thank Maybe you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.